Book 2 of Civil Government, Chapter 19 of the Dissolution of Government, Section 211. He that will with any clearness speak of the dissolution of government, ought in the first place to distinguish between the dissolution of the society and the dissolution of the government that which makes the community, and brings men out of the loose state of nature, into one politic society, is the agreement which every one has with the rest to incorporate, and act as one body, and so be one distinct commonwealth. The usual, and almost only way whereby this union is dissolved, is the inroad of foreign force making a conquest upon them, for in that case, not being able to maintain and support themselves, as one entire and independent body, the union belonging to the body which consisted therein, must necessarily cease, and so every one return to the state he was in before, with a liberty to shift for himself, and provide for his own safety, as he thinks fit, in some other society. Whenever the society is dissolved, it is certain the government of that society cannot remain. Thus conquerors' swords often cut up governments by the roots, and mangle societies to pieces separating the subdued or scattered multitude from the protection of, and dependence on, that society which ought to have preserved them from violence. The world is too well instructed in, and too forward to allow of, this way of dissolving of governments, to need any more to be said of it, and there wants not much argument to prove, that where the society is dissolved, the government cannot remain, that being as impossible, as for the frame of an house to subsist when the materials of it are scattered and dissipated by a whirlwind, or jumbled into a confused heap by an earthquake. Section 212. Besides this overturning from without, governments are dissolved from within, first, when the legislative is altered, civil society being a state of peace, amongst those who are of it, from whom the state of war is excluded by the umpirage which they have provided in their legislative, for the ending all differences that may arise amongst any of them, it is in their legislative, that the members of a commonwealth are united, and combine together into one coherent living body. This is the soul that gives form, life, and unity, to their commonwealth, from hence the several members have their mutual influence, sympathy, and connection, and therefore, when the legislative is broken, or dissolved, Dissolution and death follows, for the essence and union of the society consisting in having one will. The legislative, when once established by the majority, has the declaring, and as it or keeping of that will. The constitution of the legislative is the first and fundamental act of society, whereby provision is made for the continuation of their union, under the direction of persons, and bonds of laws, made by persons authorized thereunto by the consent and appointment of the people, without which no one man, or number of men, amongst them, can have authority of making laws that shall be binding to the rest, when any one, or more, shall take upon them to make laws, whom the people have not appointed so to do, they make laws without authority, which the people are not therefore bound to obey, by which means they come again to be out of subjection, and may constitute to themselves a new legislative, as they think best being in full liberty to resist the force of those, who without authority would impose anything upon them. Every one is at the disposure of his own will, when those who had, by the delegation of the society, the declaring of the public will, are excluded from it, and others usurp the place, who have no such authority or delegation. Section 213. This being usually brought about by such in the commonwealth who misuse the power they have, it is hard to consider it a right, and know at whose door to lay it, without knowing the form of government in which it happens. Let us suppose then the legislative placed in the concurrence of three distinct persons, a single hereditary person, having the constant, supreme, executive power, and with it the power of convoking and dissolving the other two within certain periods of time. An assembly of hereditary nobility, an assembly of representatives chosen, pro tempore, by the people, such a form of government supposed, it is evident. Section 214. First, that when such a single person, or prince, sets up his own arbitrary will in place of the laws, which are the will of the society, declared by the legislative, then the legislative is changed, for that being in effect the legislative, whose rules and laws are put in execution, 
and required to be obeyed, when other laws are set up, and other rules pretended, and enforced, than what the legislative, constituted by the society, have enacted, it is plain that the legislative is changed, whoever introduces new laws, not being thereunto authorized by the fundamental appointment of the society, or subverts the old, disowns and overturns the power by which they were made, and so sets up a new legislative. Section 215. Secondly, when the prince hinders the legislative from assembling in its due time, or from acting freely, pursuant to those ends for which it was constituted, the legislative is altered, for it is not a certain number of men, no, nor their meeting, unless they have also freedom of debating, and leisure of perfecting, what is for the good of the society, wherein the legislative consists, when these are taken away or altered, so as to deprive the society of the due exercise of their power, the legislative is truly altered, for it is not names that constitute governments, but the use and exercise of those powers that were intended to accompany them, so that he, who takes away the freedom, or hinders the acting of the legislative in its due seasons, in effect takes away the legislative, and puts an end to the government. Section 216. Thirdly, when, by the arbitrary power of the prince, the electors, or ways of election, are altered, without the consent, and contrary to the common interest of the people, there also the legislative is altered, for, if others than those whom the society hath authorized thereunto, do choose, or in another way than what the society hath prescribed, those chosen are not the legislative appointed by the people. Section 217. Fourthly, the delivery also of the people into the subjection of a foreign power, either by the prince, or by the legislative, is certainly a change of the legislative, and so a dissolution of the government, for the end why people entered into society being to be preserved one entire, free, independent society, to be governed by its own laws, this is lost, whenever they are given up into the power of another. Section 218 Why, in such a constitution as this, the dissolution of the government in these cases is to be imputed to the prince, is evident, because he, having the force, treasure and offices of the state to employ, and often persuading himself, or being flattered by others, that as supreme magistrate he is incapable of control. He alone is in a condition to make great advances towards such changes, under pretense of lawful authority, and has it in his hands to terrify or suppress opposers, as factious, seditious, and enemies to the government, whereas no other part of the legislative, or people, is capable by themselves to attempt any alteration of the legislative without open and visible rebellion, apt enough to be taken notice of, which, when it prevails, produces effects very little different from foreign conquest. Besides, the prince in such a form of government, having the power of dissolving the other parts of the legislative, and thereby rendering them private persons, they can never in opposition to him, or without his concurrence, alter the legislative by a law his consent being necessary to give any of their decrees that sanction, but yet, so far as the other parts of the legislative any way contribute to any attempt upon the government, and do either promote, or not, what lies in them, hinder such designs, they are guilty, and partake in this, which is certainly the greatest crime men can be guilty of one towards another. Section 219. There is one way more whereby such a government may be dissolved. And that is, when he who has the supreme executive power, neglects and abandons that charge, so that the laws already made can no longer be put in execution. This is demonstratively to reduce all to anarchy, and so effectually to dissolve the government, for laws not being made for themselves, but to be, by their execution, the bonds of the society to keep every part of the body politic in its due place and function, when that totally ceases, the government visibly ceases, and the people become a confused multitude, without order or connection, where there is no longer the administration of justice, for the securing of men's rights, nor any remaining power within the community to direct the force, or provide for the necessities of the public, there certainly is no government left, where the laws cannot be executed. It is all one as if there were no laws, 
and a government without laws is, I suppose, a mystery in politics, unconceivable to human capacity, and inconsistent with human society. Section 220 In these and the like cases, when the government is dissolved, the people are at liberty to provide for themselves, by erecting a new legislative, differing from the other, by the change of persons, or form, or both, as they shall find it most for their safety and good, for the society can never, by the fault of another, lose the native and original right it has to preserve itself, which can only be done by a settled legislative, and a fair and impartial execution of the laws made by it. But the state of mankind is not so miserable that they are not capable of using this remedy, till it be too late to look for any to tell people they may provide for themselves, by erecting a new legislative, when by oppression, artifice, or being delivered over to a foreign power, their old one is gone, is only to tell them, they may expect relief when it is too late, and the evil is past cure. This is in effect no more than to bid them first be slaves and then to take care of their liberty, and when their chains are on, tell them, they may act like freemen. This, if barely so, is rather mockery than relief, and men can never be secure from tyranny, if there be no means to escape it till they are perfectly under it, and therefore it is, that they have not only a right to get out of it, but to prevent it. Section 221. There is therefore, secondly, another way whereby governments are dissolved and that is, when the legislative, or the prince, either of them, act contrary to their trust. First, the legislative acts against the trust reposed in them, when they endeavor to invade the property of the subject, and to make themselves, or any part of the community, masters, or arbitrary disposers of the lives, liberties, or fortunes of the people. Section 222. The reason why men enter into society, is the preservation of their property, and the end why they choose and authorize a legislative, is, that there may be laws made, and rules set, as guards and fences to the properties of all the members of the society, to limit the power, and moderate the dominion, of every part and member of the society, for since it can never be supposed to be the will of the society, that the legislative should have a power to destroy that which every one designs to secure, by entering into society, and for which the people submitted themselves to legislators of their own making, whenever the legislators endeavored to take away, and destroy the property of the people, or to reduce them to slavery under arbitrary power, they put themselves into a state of war, with the people, who are thereupon absolved from any further obedience, and are left to the common refuge, which God hath provided for all men against force and violence. Whensoever therefore the legislative shall transgress this fundamental rule of society, and either by ambition, fear, folly or corruption, endeavor to grasp themselves, or put into the hands of any other, an absolute power over the lives, liberties, and estates of the people, by this breach of trust they forfeit the power the people had put into their hands for quite contrary ends, and it devolves to the people, who have a right to resume their original liberty, and, by the establishment of a new legislative, such as they shall think fit, provide for their own safety and security, which is the end for which they are in society. What I have said here, concerning the legislative in general, holds true also concerning the supreme executor, who having a double trust put in him, both to have a part in the legislative, and the supreme execution of the law, acts against both when he goes about to set up his own arbitrary will as the law of the society, he acts also contrary to his trust, when he either employs the force, treasure, and offices of the society, to corrupt the representatives, and gain them to his purposes, or openly pre-engages the electors, and prescribes to their choice, such, whom he has, by solicitations, threats, promises, or otherwise, won to his designs and employs them to bring in such, who have promised beforehand what to vote, and what to enact. Thus to regulate candidates and electors, and new model the ways of election, what is it but to cut up the government by the roots, and poison the very fountain of public security? For the people having reserved to themselves the choice of their representatives, as the fence to their properties, could do it for no other end, but that they might always be freely chosen, and so chosen 
freely act, and advise, as the necessity of the common wealth, and the public good should, upon examination, and mature debate, be judged to require this, those who give their votes before they hear the debate, and have weighed the reasons on all sides, are not capable of doing to prepare such an assembly as this, and endeavor to set up the declared abettors of his own will, for the true representatives of the people, and the lawmakers of the society, is certainly as great a breach of trust, and as perfect a declaration of a design to subvert the government, as is possible to be met with to which, if one shall add rewards and punishments visibly employed to the same end, and all the arts of perverted law made use of, to take off and destroy all that stand in the way of such a design, and will not comply and consent to betray the liberties of their country, it will be passed out what is doing, what power they ought to have in the society, who thus employ it contrary to the trust went along with it in its first institution, is easy to determine, and one cannot but see, that he, who has once attempted any such thing as this, cannot any longer be trusted. Section 223. To this perhaps it will be said, that the people being ignorant, and always discontented, to lay the foundation of government in the unsteady opinion and uncertain humor of the people, is to expose it to certain ruin, and no government will be able long to subsist, if the people may set up a new legislative, whenever they take offense at the old one. To this I answer, quite the contrary. People are not so easily got out of their old forms, as some are apt to suggest. They are hardly to be prevailed with to amend the acknowledged faults in the frame they have been accustomed to. And if there be any original defects, or adventitious ones introduced by time, or corruption, it is not an easy thing to get them changed, even when all the world sees there is an opportunity for it. This slowness and aversion in the people to quite their old constitutions, has, in the many revolutions which have been seen in this kingdom, in this and former ages, still kept us to, or, after some interval of fruitless attempts, still brought us back again to our old legislative of king, lords and commons, and whatever provocations have made the crown be taken from some of our princes' heads, they never carried the people so far as to place it in another line. Section 224. But it will be said, this hypothesis lays a ferment for frequent rebellion. To which I answer, first, no more than any other hypothesis, for when the people are made miserable, and find themselves exposed to the ill usage of arbitrary power, cry up their governors, as much as you will, for sons of Jupiter, let them be sacred and divine, descended, or authorized from heaven, give them out for whom or what you please, the same will happen. The people generally ill-treated, and contrary to right, will be ready upon any occasion to ease themselves of a burden that sits heavy upon them. They will wish, and seek for the opportunity, which in the change, weakness and accidents of human affairs, seldom delays long to offer itself. He must have lived but a little while in the world, who has not seen examples of this in his time, and he must have read very little, who cannot produce examples of it in all sorts of governments in the world. Section 225. Secondly, I answer, such revolutions happen not upon every little mismanagement in public affairs. Great mistakes in the ruling part, many wrong and inconvenient laws, and all the slips of human frailty, will be borne by the people without mutiny or murmur. But if a long train of abuses, prevarications and artifices, all tending the same way, make the design visible to the people, and they cannot but feel what they lie under, and see whither they are going, it is not to be wondered, that they should then ruse themselves, and endeavor to put the rule into such hands which may secure them the ends for which government was at first erected, and without which, ancient names, and specious forms, are so far from being better, that they are much worse, than the state of nature, or pure anarchy, the inconveniencies being all as great and as near, but the remedy farther off and more difficult. Section. 226. Thirdly, I answer, that this doctrine of a power in the people of providing for their safety a new, by a new legislative, when their legislators have acted contrary to their trust, by invading their property, is the best fence against rebellion, and the probablest means to hinder it, for rebellion being in opposition, not to persons, but authority, 
which is founded only in the constitutions and laws of the government, those, whoever they be, who by force break through, and by force justify their violation of them, are truly and properly rebels, for when men, by entering into society and civil government, have excluded force, and introduced laws for the preservation of property, peace, and unity amongst themselves, those who set up force again in opposition to the laws, do rebel air, that is, bring back again the state of war, and are properly rebels, which they who are in power, by the pretense they have to authority, the temptation of force they have in their hands, and the flattery of those about them, being likeliest to do, the properest way to prevent the evil, is to show them the danger and injustice of it, who are under the greatest temptation to run into it. Section 227 In both the forementioned cases, when neither the legislative is changed, or the legislators act contrary to the end for which they were constituted, those who are guilty are guilty of rebellion, for if any one by force takes away the established legislative of any society, and the laws by them made, pursuant to their trust, he thereby takes away the umpirage, which every one had consented to, for a peaceable decision of all their controversies, and a bar to the state of war. Amongst them, they, who remove, or change the legislative, take away this decisive power, which nobody can have, but by the appointment and consent of the people, and so destroying the authority which the people did, and nobody else can set up, and introducing a power which the people hath not authorized, they actually introduce a state of war, which is that of force without authority, and thus, by removing the legislative established by the society, in whose decisions the people acquiesced and united, as to that of their own will, they untie the knot, and expose the people anew to the state of war. And if those, who by force take away the legislative, are rebels, the legislators themselves, as has been shown, can be no less esteemed so, when they, who were set up for the protection, and preservation of the people, their liberties and properties, shall by force invade and endeavor to take them away, and so they putting themselves into a state of war with those who made them the protectors and guardians of their peace, are properly, and with the greatest aggravation, rebellants, rebels. Section 228 But if they, who say it lays a foundation for rebellion, mean that it may occasion civil wars, or intestine broils, to tell the people they are absolved from obedience when illegal attempts are made upon their liberties or properties, and may oppose the unlawful violence of those who are their magistrates, when they invade their properties contrary to the trust put in them, and that therefore this doctrine is not to be allowed, being so destructive to the peace of the world, they may as well say, upon the same ground, that honest men may not oppose robbers or pirates, because this may occasion disorder or bloodshed. If any mischief come in such cases, it is not to be charged upon him who defends his own right, but on him that invades his neighbors. If the innocent honest man must quietly quit all he has, for peace's sake, to him who will lay violent hands upon it, I desire it may be considered, what a kind of peace there will be in the world, which consists only in violence and rapine and which is to be maintained only for the benefit of robbers and oppressors, who would not think it an admirable peace betwixt the mighty and the mean, when the lamb, without resistance, yielded his throat to be torn by the imperious wolf. Polyphemus's den gives us a perfect pattern of such a peace, and such a government, wherein Ulysses and his companions had nothing to do, but quietly to suffer themselves to be devoured. And no doubt Ulysses, who was a prudent man, preached up passive obedience, and exhorted them to a quiet submission, by representing to them of what concernment peace was to mankind, and by showing the inconveniences might happen, if they should offer to resist Polyphemus, who had now the power over them. Section 229 The end of government is the good of mankind, and which is best for mankind, that the people should be always exposed to the boundless will of tyranny or that the rulers should be sometimes liable to be opposed, when they grow exorbitant in the use of their power, and employ it for the destruction, and not the preservation of the properties of their people. Section 230 Nor let any one say, that mischief can arise from hence, as often as it shall please a busy head, or turbulent spirit, to desire the alteration of the government. It is true, 
Such men may stir, whenever they please, but it will be only to their own just ruin and perdition, for till the mischief be grown general, and the ill designs of the rulers become visible, or their attempts sensible to the greater part, the people, who are more disposed to suffer than right themselves by resistance, are not apt to stir. The examples of particular injustice, or oppression of here and there an unfortunate man, moves them not. But if they universally have a persuasion, grounded upon manifest evidence, that designs are carrying on against their liberties, and the general course and tendency of things cannot but give them strong suspicions of the evil intention of their governors, who is to be blamed for it? Who can help it? if they, who might avoid it, bring themselves into this suspicion. Are the people to be blamed, if they have the sense of rational creatures, and can think of things no otherwise than as they find and feel them? And is it not rather their fault, who put things into such a posture, that they would not have them thought to be as they are? I grant, that the pride, ambition, and turbulency of private men have sometimes caused great disorders in commonwealths and factions have been fatal to states and kingdoms. But whether the mischief hath oftener begun in the people's wantonness, and a desire to cast off the lawful authority of their rulers, or in the rulers' insolence, and endeavours to get and exercise an arbitrary power over their people, whether oppression, or disobedience, gave the first rise to the disorder, I leave it to impartial history to determine. This I am sure, whoever, either ruler or subject, by force goes about to invade the rights of either prince or people, and lays the foundation for overturning the constitution and frame of any just government, is highly guilty of the greatest crime, I think, a man is capable of, being to answer, for all those mischiefs of blood, rapine, and desolation, which the breaking to pieces of governments bring on a country. And he who does it, is justly to be esteemed the common enemy and pest of mankind and is to be treated accordingly. Section 231 That subjects or foreigners, attempting by force on the properties of any people, may be resisted with force, is agreed on all hands, but that magistrates, doing the same thing, may be resisted, hath of late been denied, as if those who had the greatest privileges and advantages by the law, had thereby a power to break those laws, by which alone they were set in a better place than their brethren whereas their offence is thereby the greater, both as being ungrateful for the greater share they have by the law, and breaking also that trust, which is put into their hands by their brethren. Section 232 Whosoever uses force without right, as every one does in society, who does it without law, puts himself into a state of war with those against whom he so uses it, and in that state all former ties are cancelled, all other rights cease and every one has a right to defend himself, and to resist the aggressor. This is so evident, that Barclay himself, that great asserter of the power and sacredness of kings, is forced to confess, that it is lawful for the people, in some cases, to resist their king, and that too in a chapter, wherein he pretends to show, that the divine law shuts up the people from all manner of rebellion. Whereby it is evident, even by his own doctrine, that, since they may, in some cases resist, all resisting of princes is not rebellion. His words are these, Quod sicis dicat, ergon populus tyrannis screwed litity and furore jugulum semper prebet, ergon multitudo civitates suas fame, ferro, and flamma vastari, seek, conjurges, and liberos fortune ludibrio and tyranny libidini exponi, incomnia vite pericula omnesque miserias and molestias erage deduci patientia, ne males quod omni animantium generis te natura tributum, de negari debet, ut sc. vim vi repellent, sesec, ab injuria tuiuntur, huic brevitoris bonsum sit, populo universo negari defensionum, ca juris naturalisist, necultionum ca pretinaturumist advisis regim concedi de beer, qua propter si rex non in singulars tantum personas aliquot privatum odium exercit, st corpus et am publis, cugis ips caputist, 1. e. totum populum, valensinum aliquam medius partum imani and intolerandus et tyranni divexit, populo, quidem hoc casu resistendi acet twendi se ab injuria. Pitsters competit, st twendi se tantum, non enim in principum invadendi, 
and restituent injury elate, non recidine da debita reverentia propta accept am injuriam, presentum denic impetum propulsandi non vim pretrit amulsis antigis habet. Horum enum alter remain naturist, ut vitam silicit corpus quima, alterum vera contra naturum, ut inferior de superior re supplicium sumat, quod tarc populus malum, and equam factum sit, impedia petit, ne fiat, id postquam factum ist. In regim authorem sealeris vindicare non petist, populus agiatia hoc amplius quam privatus quispiam habet, quod huic, evil ipsis adversarius judicibus, excepto bucanano, nullum nisi in patientia remedium superist, carmelsi intolerabilis tyrannus ist, modicum enim ferum nino debet, resistere cum reverentia posit, Barclay contra monitum. 50. 3. 100. 8. In English thus, section. 233. But if any one should ask, must the people then always lay themselves open to the cruelty and rage of tyranny? Must they see their cities pillaged, and laid in ashes, their wives and children exposed to the tyrant's lust and fury, and themselves and families reduced by their king to ruin, and all the miseries of want and oppression? and yet sit still, must men alone be debarred the common privilege of opposing force with force, which nature allows so freely to all other creatures for their preservation from injury. I answer, self-defense is a part of the law of nature, nor can it be denied the community, even against the king himself, but to revenge themselves upon him, must by no means be allowed them, it being not agreeable to that law. Wherefore if the king shall show an hatred, not only to some particular persons, but sets himself against the body of the commonwealth, whereof he is the head, and shall, with intolerable ill usage, cruelly tyrannize over the whole, or a considerable part of the people, in this case the people have a right to resist and defend themselves from injury, but it must be with this caution, that they only defend themselves, but do not attack their prince, they may repair the damages received, but must not for any provocation exceed the bounds of due reverence and respect. They may repulse the present attempt, but must not revenge past violences, for it is natural for us to defend life and limb, but that an inferior should punish a superior, is against nature. The mischief which is designed them, the people may prevent before it be done, but when it is done, they must not revenge it on the king, though author of the villainy. This therefore is the privilege of the people in general, above what any private person hath that particular men are allowed by our adversaries, themselves, Buchanan only accepted, to have no other remedy, but patience, but the body of the people may with respect resist intolerable tyranny, for when it is but moderate, they ought to endure it. Section. 234. Thus far that great advocate of monarchical power allows of resistance. Section. 235. It is true, he has annexed two limitations to it to no purpose, first, he says, it must be with reverence, secondly, it must be without retribution, or punishment, and the reason he gives is, because an inferior cannot punish a superior, first, how to resist force without striking again, or how to strike with reverence, will need some skill to make intelligible, he that shall oppose an assault only with a shield to receive the blows, or in any more respectful posture, without a sword in his hand, to abate the confidence and force of the assailant, will quickly be at an end of his resistance, and will find such a defense serve only to draw on himself the worse usage. This is as ridiculous a way of resisting, as Juvenal thought it of fighting, ubit pulses, ego vapulatantum, and the success of the combat will be unavoidably the same he that describes it. Libertas pauperis hecist, pulsatus regat, and pugnis concisius, adorat. At lyciat porsis cum dentibus in reverti. This will always be the event of such an imaginary resistance, where men may not strike again. He therefore who may resist, must be allowed to strike, and then let our author, or anybody else, join a knock on the head, or a cut on the face, with as much reverence and respect as he thinks fit. He that can reconcile blows and reverence, may, for aught I know, desire for his pains, a civil, respectful cudgeling wherever he can meet with it. Secondly, as to his second, an inferior cannot punish a superior, that is true, generally speaking, whilst he is his superior. But to resist force with force, 
being the state of war that levels the parties, cancels all former relation of reverence, respect, and superiority, and then the odd that remains, is, that he, who opposes the unjust aggressor, has this superiority over him, that he has a right, when he prevails, to punish the offender, both for the breach of the peace, and all the evils, that followed upon it. Barclay therefore, in another place, more coherently to himself, denies it to be lawful to resist a king in any case. But he there assigns two cases, whereby a king may unking himself. His words are, quid ergo, null in casus insidea possunt quibus populo cesare girat qui in regim impotentius dominantum arma capir and invadia juris suo swac authoritate lysiat nulli certi quem de urex mane semperenim ex divini zidabstat, regim honorificato, and keep but study resist it. Ordination e resist it, non alia sigiaicha in impopulo pitsters ist quam seed committat propter quod ipsa jury rex esse decinat tancenum se ips principatu exuit at qui in privatis constituit liber, hoc modo populus and superior recita, reverso adam esse. Jury ala quod anti regim inauguratum in interigno habuit ad sunt pol corum generum commissa ejus modi ke hunc effectum pariunt at ego cum plurima animo perlistrem, duo tantum invenio, duos, inquam, casus quibus rex ipso facto ex rig non regim se facit and omni honor and dignitate regali ad qui in subditos put state destituit, quorum et ammemanit winsuus horum unassist. Si runim dispid at, quid modem dinero in furture, quod is nempi senatum populum cromanum, at quia deo urbem ipsum ferro flamac vast e, a si novas sibi seds carida de crevisit, et de caligula, quod palum dinun sarit se nec sivem nec principum senatui amplius for, inc animo habuerit interempto utrias cordinis electissimo quo calexandriam comigrare, a si at populum uno ictu interimerid. Unimai servisum optavit talia cum rex aliquis meditata. An religia serio, omnim regnandi curum and animum illigo abjicit, a c pro and imperium in subditos amatit, ut dominus servi pro derelicto habiti dominium. Section. 236. Alter casus ist, c rex in aliquigis clientlum sacentulit, a c rinim quod libra me major ribus and popula traditum accepit. Alien edition emancipavit nam tun quem vis forte non ni amanti id agit populo plainat incomod, tamen quia quod precipa mistrici dignitati samasit, ut summis silicit in regno secundum dum sit, and solo deo inferior, at qui populum et dam totum ignorantum vil invitum, gugis libertatum satam and tectam conserver debuit, in ulterius gentis dicinum and potstatum dedidit. Hac valut quod amrini ab alienation efficit, ut nec quod ips in regno imperium habuit retiniet, nec inum qui collatum valuit, juris quiquam transferat, ad quiet reo facto librum jam and superstitis populum relinquit, gugis rexemplum unum anas scotis he superditent, Barclay contra monichum. 50. 3. 100. 16. Which in English runs thus, section. 237. What then, can the no case happen wherein the people may of right, and by their own authority, help themselves, take arms, and set upon their king, imperiously domineering over them? None at all, whilst he remains a king, honor the king, and he that resists the power, resists the ordinance of God, are divine oracles that will never permit it. The people therefore can never come by a power over him unless he does something that makes him cease to be a king, for then he divests himself of his crown and dignity, and returns to the state of a private man, and the people become free and superior, the power which they had in the interregnum, before they crowned him king, devolving to them again, but there are but few miscarriages which bring the matter to this state. After considering it well on all sides, I can find but two, two cases there are, I say, whereby a king, ipso facto, becomes no king, and loses all power and regal authority over his people, which are also taken notice of by Windsor's. The first is, if he endeavor to overturn the government, that is, if he have a purpose and design to ruin the kingdom and commonwealth, as it is recorded of Nero, 
that he resolved to cut off the Senate and people of Rome, lay the city waste with fire and sword, and then remove to some other place, and of Caligula, that he openly declared, that he would be no longer our head to the people or Senate, and that he had it in his thoughts to cut off the worthiest men of both ranks, and then retire to Alexandria, and he wished that the people had but one neck, that he might dispatch them all at a blow. Such designs as these, when any king harbors in his thoughts, and seriously promotes, he immediately gives up all care and thought of the common wealth, and consequently forfeits the power of governing his subjects, as a master does the dominion over his slaves whom he hath abandoned. Section 238. The other case is, when a king makes himself the dependent of another, and subjects his kingdom which his ancestors left him, and the people put free into his hands, to the dominion of another, for however perhaps it may not be his intention to prejudice the people, yet because he has hereby lost the principal part of regal dignity, viz. to be next and immediately under God, supreme in his kingdom, and also because he betrayed or forced his people, whose liberty he ought to have carefully preserved, into the power and dominion of a foreign nation, by this, as it were, alienation of his kingdom. He himself loses the power he had in it before, without transferring any the least right to those on whom he would have bestowed it, and so by this act sets the people free, and leaves them at their own disposal. One example of this is to be found in the Scotch Annals, section 239. In these cases Barclay, the great champion of absolute monarchy, is forced to allow, that a king may be resisted, and ceases to be a king. That is, in short, not to multiply cases, in whatsoever he has no authority, there he is no king, and may be resisted, for wheresoever the authority ceases, the king ceases too, and becomes like other men who have no authority. And these two cases he instances in, differ little from those above mentioned. To be destructive to governments only that he has omitted the principle from which his doctrine flows, and that is, the breach of trust, in not preserving the form of government agreed on, and in not intending the end of government itself, which is the public good and preservation of property. When a king has dethroned himself, and put himself in a state of war with his people, what shall hinder them from prosecuting him who is no king, as they would any other man, who has put himself into a state of war with them? Barclay and those of his opinion, would do well to tell us. This further I desire may be taken notice of out of Barclay, that he says, the mischief that is designed them, the people may prevent before it be done, whereby he allows resistance when tyranny is but in design. Such designs as these, says he, when any king harbors in his thoughts and seriously promotes, he immediately gives up all care and thought of the common wealth, so that, according to him, the neglect of the public good is to be taken as an evidence of such design, or at least for a sufficient cause of resistance, and the reason of all. He gives in these words, because he betrayed or forced his people, whose liberty he ought carefully to have preserved, what he adds, into the power and dominion of a foreign nation, signifies nothing, the fault and forfeiture lying in the loss of their liberty, which he ought to have preserved and not in any distinction of the persons to whose dominion they were subjected. The people's right is equally invaded, and their liberty lost, whether they are made slaves to any of their own, or a foreign nation, and in this lies the injury, and against this only have they the right of defense. And there are instances to be found in all countries, which show, that it is not the change of nations in the persons of their governors, but the change of government that gives the offence. Bilson, a bishop of our church, and a great stickler for the power and prerogative of princes, does, if I mistake not, in his treatise of Christian subjection, acknowledge, that princes may forfeit their power, and their title to the obedience of their subjects, and if the needed authority in a case where reason is so plain, I could send my reader to Brockton, Fortescue, and the author of The Mirror, and others writers that cannot be suspected to be ignorant of our government, or enemies to it. But I thought Hooker alone might be enough to satisfy those men, who relying on him for their ecclesiastical polity, are by a strange fate carried to deny those principles upon which he builds it. Whether they are herein made the tools of cunning workmen, to pull down their own fabric, they were best look. This I am sure, 
their civil policy is so new, so dangerous, and so destructive to both rulers and people, that as former ages never could bear the broaching of it, so it may be hoped, those to come, redeemed from the impositions of these Egyptian under taskmasters, will abhor the memory of such servile flatterers, who, whilst it seemed to serve their turn, resolved all government into absolute tyranny, and would have all men born to, what their mean souls fitted them for, slavery. Section. 240. Here, it is like, the common question will be made, who shall be judge, whether the prince or legislative act contrary to their trust. This, perhaps, ill-affected and factious men may spread amongst the people when the prince only makes use of his due prerogative. To this I reply, the people shall be judge, for who shall be judge whether his trustee or deputy acts well, and according to the trust reposed in him, but he who deputes him, and must, by having deputed him, have still a power to discard him, when he fails in his trust. If this be reasonable in particular cases of private men, why should it be otherwise in that at the greatest moment? where the welfare of millions is concerned, and also where the evil, if not prevented, is greater, and the redress very difficult, dear, and dangerous. Section. 141. But farther, this question, who shall be judge? Cannot mean, that there is no judge at all, for where there is no judicature on earth, to decide controversies amongst men, God in heaven is judge. He alone, it is true is judge of the right. But every man is judge for himself, as in all other cases, so in this, whether another hath put himself into a state of war with him, and whether he should appeal to the supreme judge, as Jephthah did. Section. 242. If a controversy arise betwixt a prince and some of the people, in a matter where the law is silent, or doubtful, and the thing be of great consequence, I should, think the proper umpire, in such a case, should be the body of the people, for in cases where the prince hath a trust reposed in him, and is dispensed from the common ordinary rules of the law, there, if any men find themselves aggrieved, and think the prince acts contrary to, or beyond that trust, who so proper to judge as the body of the people, who, at first, lodge that trust in him, how far they meant it should extend, but if the prince, or whoever they be in the administration, decline that way of determination. The appeal then lies nowhere but to heaven, force between either persons, who have no known superior on earth, or which permits no appeal to a judge on earth, being properly a state of war, wherein the appeal lies only to heaven, and in that state the injured party must judge for himself, when he will think fit to make use of that appeal, and put himself upon it. Section. 243. To conclude, the power that every individual gave the society, when he entered into it, can never revert to the individuals again, as long as the society lasts, but it will always remain in the community, because without this there can be no community, no commonwealth, which is contrary to the original agreement, so also when the society hath placed the legislative in any assembly of men, to continue in them and their successors, with direction and authority for providing such successors, the legislative can never revert to the people whilst the government lasts, because having provided a legislative with power to continue forever, they have given up their political power to the legislative, and cannot resume it. But if they have set limits to the duration of their legislative, and made this supreme power in any person, or assembly, only temporary, or else, when by the miscarriages of those in authority, it is forfeited, upon the forfeiture or at the determination of the time set, it reverts to the society, and the people have a right to act as supreme, and continue the legislative in themselves, or erect a new form, or under the old form place it in new hands, as they think good. Finis.